Hello everyone, my name is Etiel Schwartz and I'm here to talk about microservices, why aren't they as easy as we are told. I'm going to talk about Kubernetes and how to use Helm in order to solve a lot of problems Kubernetes offers. So first off, I just introduce myself, like I said, Etiel, and I'm the first developer and I'm the lead production engineer at Rookout, which is a company that allows developers to debug their production environment adding live code, live logs into their production environment. Uh, previously, I worked for Frotter and before that for eBay. So as all of you must know, Kubernetes is eating the world by a storm. How many of you use Kubernetes in production? Okay, cool, a lot of people. And how many uses Helm? Okay, very nice turn turnout. And as you know, Kubernetes is cool. You can deploy a new microservice very easily. You don't need to think about it. You write one YAML file and that's it. You have your microservice up and running. So, you know, everything is quite uh, nice in the Kubernetes world. So is this talk going to be why Kubernetes and Helm are so awesome? And let me give you a very big spoiler. Uh, hell no, guys, because Kubernetes allows the developers to do a lot of things, but what people end up doing is to abuse it, which means you might have a lot of microservices, a lot of spaghetti microservices, and you don't really know where, where, where to start. Like the environment is too, too big for you to handle. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, moving, stay, moving fast but staying alive. And by the end of the session, I hope you'll see some best practices to how to manage Kubernetes and how to manage your CI CD pipeline. Uh, feel free to ask questions if needed. Uh, so the agenda, we're going to build a very basic Python app. Let's call it a SaaS application because it's going to be a very simple microservice written in Python. We're going to Kubernetes it. I'm going to see why Kubernetes, Vadina Kubernetes isn't enough. Then we're going to helm it a little bit about Jenkins and then a conclusion. Uh, so like every big uh, SaaS company, every company whatsoever, we start with a very simple microservice, which sounds like a great idea. In our case, it's a Python Flask server, which each time I'm sending a GET request, I'm getting a very cool developer quote. Like it works on my machine. During this lecture, you're going to see more slides and more quotes, and I hope everything will work because this is a live demo. Uh, presentation, so I'm hoping for the best. So you saw the Python application, now I'm going to dockerize it. I am guessing most of you are already familiar with Docker, so I'm not going to dwell into it. And for the last stage, I am going to take our very basic Python application and I'm going to deploy it into the cloud, into Kubernetes. All code is going to be deployed to the Google Cloud Engine, which our company uses. And this is a very basic deployment YAML. For those of you who know Kubernetes, then great, nothing special about here. If you don't know Kubernetes, then each time I'm saying pod or deployment, just think for yourself, it means Docker application. And if you don't know Docker, then just imagine I'm saying an application. Because basically, I'm taking an application and move it into the cloud. Okay, so that's about it. You know, like this is all you need to deploy something into the Kubernetes cloud and you know, it's super easy. Like I wrote three files, something like that, and I can now deploy this into the cloud and I'm going to do it in a couple of minutes. So what is this talk, or like why? <laughs> this is the main question. And before I'm going to deploy it into the cloud, you saw my Python code. It was about 20 lines of codes, maybe less. But it's just too big, you know? Like in modern application, we are told that each service should have only one responsibility, and 20 lines of code is just too much. And yeah, I know, I know. So we're going to break it into two microservices. We are going to have the logic micro microservice, and in our case, the logic is generate a random number. And we are going to have another microservice called the DAL, which is going to be the database abstraction layer, and he will handle the database. In our case, the database is 200 quotes written in JSON file. So just to 
give you a detailed look. I am a happy user. I am going to the backend service, and the backend service does its logic, which is generate me a random number, and it fetch it, it from that DAL service. So, you know, actually, that's about it for now. Like, this is the code. It's not that interesting. And now let's go to the live production uh, code of the event. Hope everything will work. So. I'm going to do make run. Make run basically is deploying. I have a deployment YAML file for the backend app and the DAL application. And basically, now what I'm doing is deploying it into the cloud. Nothing fancy about here. And I'm going to cheat a little because I don't have a load balancer or a node port. So in order to access the cloud, the Google Cloud Engine, I'm just going to do port forwarding, which means my local computer request will be forwarded into the Kubernetes cloud. Everyone can see this? Okay, great. So it seemed like it worked. It seemed like it worked, right? I now have a developer quote. Very cool by Mark Twain, actually. I can hit refresh and I suppose to get another quote, Albert Einstein. Okay, so everything is working quite nicely, actually. Uh, so what's the big issue here? So as you all know, I'm quite happy now, but a developer life, usually happiness is very short because the real world tend to interfere with our great backend and the customers are saying, no, 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 this is not what I want. This is not what I signed up for. And for our application also, this is the case. People want the search capability. They are like, no, this is too random. I want the ability to search for quote, not only get a random quote. So, you know, I'm like, okay, okay, I can make it work. I can add a search functionality. And because we are living in a microservice-based architecture, then luckily for us, we don't need to change one place, but two places. We need to add the search functionality both on our DAL and on our backend. So this is the code. Again, the code isn't that interesting and everything is open source on GitHub. So, you know, I'm going to add the, the search functionality. And let's see it up and running. I didn't change the YAML files. I only updated the Docker version. And it's running. As you can see, I changed the main microservice and the DAL. So let's do port forwarding again. So again, as you can see, I am a good developer. I write a code that actually works and everything is great, you know, like, like this lecture is going really well and I can search for thing, I can search for, I don't know, bug. And it's still working, so yeah, like everything is good. Uh, so let's just do a quick recap. Now we have both the get capability and the search capability. So let me just show you everything is still working, okay? This is the old endpoint. Oh no. Let's not panic, guys. Let's not panic. Things like that tend to happen on live demo. Things just break up and I forgot to tell you guys that I added another very small piece of code inside my DAL service and basically this code runs only on my local computer. It says if you're on Mac, then yeah, everything is good. If you are not on Mac, then crash the application. And I forgot to tell you when I deployed it. <laughs> but good thing, I thought, uh, I thought about it and I can just revert the DAL service and everything will be good again. So now that I'm running this, I should see only the dull change, but not the backend. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. You can see that the Dalits change. You can see that the backend didn't really change. And now I can hit refresh. Mm -hmm. ah, I didn't do the port file. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was a close one, right? But I managed to make it work. And now let's just check what happens when I hit the old search functionality because, uh, because I should be getting 404 because it's not implemented on this version, right? So let's see. And shit, I got another 500. And again, again, this tend to happen on live demos, right? So let's not panic. What happened is that I changed the DAL, but I didn't change my backend. So now they are in incompatible state. So all I need to do now is just revert everything and hopefully everything will be good. So as you can see, the main has changed, but the DAL didn't change. I'll just do one port forwarding. And great, now I'm getting what I expected to see, which is uh, 404. So I know what you must be thinking to yourself. Uh, this is a live demo, it doesn't really happen on real lives. We are a good developers, we know our dependency, we, it wouldn't happen to us. So there is a very nice blog post, to, so to those of you who have read, read uh, by segment, how they transform the monolith into 100 microservices and then back again to one monolith application. And this is because they just couldn't handle the dependencies. And this is, uh, I don't know, like the modern application, like no one knows what happened on the cloud. So let's just take a minute and talk about the problems with uh, vanilla Kubernetes. We wrote a lot of boilerplate code for once. The second one is that there is no easy way of testing your code before going to production, like the full environment. And the third one, which is super, super, super important, but people don't really uh, tend to talk about, is there are no version control for def dependencies, which is built in, in Kubernetes, like vanilla Kubernetes. So this is a part of a bigger trend in the world today of moving fast and breaking things, like the new DevOps is just, okay, I'm writing the code, how fast can I make it run on my production environment? So a lot of people are putting their effort, their time, and in making this as fast as they can, but they tend to forget that before going to production, it's, it can be very nice to test our code, and, but people are, People are talking about testing, it's not like unheard of, but the thing that people really don't think about is how did they roll back their code after it crashes. So yeah, I bet most of you already know GitHub had an issue last week. Uh, Google crashes, Amazon crashes, your application is going to crash. If you have real customers in production, it will crash. It's not a question of maybe it won't crash, it's a question of when. So you need to ask yourself, do I know what to do? after the application is going to crash? Do I have a very fast rollback mechanism to support my very first CI-CD system? And luckily for us, we have Helm to the rescue. For those of you who knows Helm, then Helm is not the thing that you put on your head like I did here, but it's a steering for the boat, but this image is funnier. So before going into installing Helm and using Helm, there is the question of what is Helm? And Helm describes itself as the package manager for Kubernetes. And it sounds pretty straightforward. I know NPM, I know PIP, I know Maven, but what does it mean in the Kubernetes cloud to be a package manager? Does it help me to download my packages, to upload my packages? Does it help me to control my Kubernetes cluster, my application? Like, Helm does a lot of things, and at the first time that I read about Helm, I told to myself, nah, nah, it, it, I just don't understand it. It's too complicated, I'm not going to use it. But actually, Helm isn't that difficult to get started with, and it has really great benefits. 
So again, I'm going to show you, to talk about how to use Helm and why to use Helm. So I'm going to speak a little bit about like uh, a chart, and for those of you who don't know, chart is a very simple way for deploying multiple microservices, multiple Kubernetes resources in one shot. I'm going to take to talk about a repository. A repository is basically a chart uh, collection, and a release is a version of Kubernetes, a version of our Helm chart deployed into the cloud. And if I talk too fast during this slide, no worry. I'm going to go over all of this. Termin termin terminology uh, in the next slide. So a chart is the basic Kubernetes, uh, the basic Helm unit. Basically, when you do Helm in Helm start chart, then you get, I don't know, like 20 files which are really stressful, and this is how Helm are selling the chart. But actually, all you need to do to create a very basic chart, like I took our Kubernetes application and Helmed it, and basically, you need a chart YAML, which has the metadata about this version. And I change my normal deployment. And instead of hard-coded version, hard-coded the uh, Docker tag, now I have this values YAML file. And when I'm going to do Helm deploy, it will evaluate the value in my values file and insert it into the deployment YAML. And another super, super important thing chart YAML has is this thing, the version. And as you can remember, like five minutes ago, we had a version issues that we couldn't really control. So luckily for us, Helm is going to help us to solve it. So I'm running my Helm. Uh, one small thing, Helm doesn't really know how to upgrade existing resources, so I need to delete my old backend. And this command, this part, do you see it? I'll just make it? This line of code basically means take the chart that is in the folder uh, backend slash quotes backend chart and insert it into the cluster. So now if I'm going to do LMLS, I should see a backend, uh, a Helm backend deployment. So yeah, like. I know what you're thinking, nothing special, right? We had a backend earlier, but let's see two very cool Helm features now. So, אז בתכלס, אחד הדברים שאנחנו הרבה פעמים עושים, אם אנחנו עובדים ב-CICD, זה פשוט להשתמש בדוקר פעם שכל הזמן עולה. אז במקרה שלנו, מה שאני הולך לעשות, זה להגיד, אוקיי, okay, עזוב, אני לא רוצה באמת להרוס את ה-YAML files, לא מעניין אותי, הוא לא השתנה. מה שאני הולך לעשות, אה, סורי, אה, אני מתחיל ש... כן, כן, אני הבריאו. אז, כמו שאתה יודע, הדוקר טאג היא משהו שהשתנה, אבל ה-YAML פייל לא השתנה בין המיקרוסרוויסים. אז אני יכול רק להשתמש באופן הזה, עם ה-CLI קומנד. And then when I'm going to do the deployment, I add, uh, I said, okay, when you're going to evaluate this chart inside the image tag, just do some fake, uh, fake, some fake Docker tag, yeah, good name. And it will evaluate it into a new deployment with this tag. But now if I'm going to check my pods, like what's running on my Kubernetes cluster, I'm going to see I have one image in pullback off, which is sucks, I don't know. And I can do, like again, one of the features, the things that we didn't have earlier is a very way, very easy way to do our rollback. So now, thanks to Helm, I can just do this. I'm doing the command Helm rollback backend one. Take the backend, backend the Helm release and revert to the first version that exist, existed. And now, I look at my pods and everything is great. Okay, so I again, our application is gaining a lot of traffic and we just can't handle the scale. So what we are going to do is to add the Redis cache layer. So to add the Redis cache layer, like locally, it's very easy, but inside the cloud, I need to create a deployment, I need to create a service, I need to do a lot of things in order to add Redis to my infrastructure. So. Helm comes to our rescue, and using the requirement YAML file, I can simply add three lines of YAML code, 
I don't know, YAML. And basically, I want to say, when you're deploying this chart, when you're deploying the backend, please also download and install a Redis chart. The Redis chart, in our case, is some open source Redis, a community-based Redis chart uh, by Bitamani, if I'm not mistaken. And basically, it allows us to deploy a new infrastructure very easily and very fast. So again, one second. And again, what I'm doing now is, first of all, I'm saying, Helm, please download all the subcharts that I depend upon. And the second one is just, Helm, upgrade my existing deployment. So it's installing it. And now when I'm going to hit pods, then not only that I'm going to see my existing backend and existing DAL, but I'm going to see two new Redis deployments and two new Redis services. So basically, I just wrote three lines of YAML code, and I got ba back a full-blown Redis master slave uh, running up, up and running inside my cluster. So our time is running out, so I'm going to speak very shortly about an umbrella chart. An umbrella chart is a generic name of one chart that handles multiple subchart. And in our case, both in my company and in this example, we're saying, okay, I want all of the stack, all of the microservices to be deployed as a whole, like one shot. So now when I'm going to do Helm deploy for a Helm chart that has only this requirement YAML file, and not only that I'm going to deploy one microservice, but all of the microservices with their version aligned. So if I want to do a rollback, then the rollback will, be, will happen on all microservices at the same time. So let me just do it very, very quickly. And that's it for the live demo. So again, I'm doing a Helm upgrade. I'm saying install uh, to uh, the deployment named full deploy, which is in the directory umbrella. And actually, I cheated a little because I added another feature Helm has to offer to this line. And I added the minus minus namespace. So if you work with Kubernetes, you must be aware of namespaces. And a namespace is a very easy way to separate your different environments. And using Helm, I can say, okay, take this thing and put it inside my staging namespace. Don't, I don't need to change my YAML files, but Helm does it for me. And now, now let's say that I'm really happy about this code. So I can see that everything is working on my staging, right? I can see, and maybe I'll do some user testing or things like that. And one of the ready slave has a problem. Okay, later. And Let's say everything really worked, and now I can say, okay, take this exact same chart, this exact same deployment, services, everything, and deploy it and promote it into my production environment. So, you can do something like this. Take the same thing, but install it inside the prod namespace. So basically, we talked about the problem that we didn't have an easy way of testing our application before going into the production, but now we have a very, very simple way of doing so. Okay, so this, I'm not going to go over it. Like I said, it's going to be open source, but basically this is the great things about Helm, a single source of truth for your microservices, uh, the ability to roll back very fast, the ability to deploy to a different namespace, and the ability to use different values file for different environment very easily. I didn't really show it on today. So the last thing I want to talk about, because we're running out of time, is how you should treat your CI CD. The new Kubernetes approach is treat your servers like uh, cattle, not beloved pets. So if one cow dies, then I just bring another cow to replace it. This is like the new hype. And I'm saying, OK, you should do the same, but also with your CI CD pipeline, which means have one single 
pipeline. This is like an example of our pipeline. And force all of the developers across your organization to use it, which means they must have a Docker file. They must have an Helm package command. They must uh, automat they are automatically promoted into staging. In case they have any issue, then we are going to roll back to the previous good state of staging. So it's not really an implementation, but the important thing is using Helm, using the Helm package command. You can really force a generic abstraction that helps the developers, help you to manage the CI CD across a lot of microservices. And for the last thing I want to talk about is Jenkins. People really hate Jenkins. My CEO really dead to Jenkins all day long. Uh, but in the end of the day, uh, Jenkins has survived Kubernetes, serverless, like on-premise. No matter where you go, Jenkins is just there. And one of the biggest advantages Jenkins has to offer is the shared pipeline directory, which means I can write one in one place the pipeline for my CI CD. And each new microservice, each new repository, will pick up this CI CD and just use it. So I have a generic way of creating a uniform, uniform uh, pipeline. We used to work in CircleCI, which was great for one repo. But if you have 10 microservices, then you need to copy the Circle YAML file, which is a lot of work. So basically, when a new developer at my company want to write a new microservice, he need to create the Helm directory. But other than that, the Jenkins file is only four lines of code. So to conclude our talk, uh, managing microservices is hard. Helm make it easier. And you can find all of my resources uh, on GitHub. Uh, basically, we live in a really, really cool timeline where the problem is not to deploy our application, but the fact that we are deploying too fast and too rapid for our own good. So it's quite cool. And last is uh, Kubernetes and Helm are like peanut butter and jelly. OK, thank you very much.